in the first session, I really I wanted you to be able to see uh, the Simone Vey who had warts. Uh, and and now I even want to contradict a little bit of what I was saying on purpose, but like just so you know, I, I don't think she was an angel. On the other hand, um, maybe she was. For example, she was never diagnosed with Asperger's or autism, but she shows these different symptoms. I'm not sure that's a disability. It, Maybe in some ways. It is if you're trying to get through high school in British Columbia. <laughs> but she, or anywhere. But she, she may not have had that. No one ever officially died. But if she did, I, what's certain is this. She saw the world differently. Yeah. And, and who am I to say that my way of seeing the world is better? Uh, I'm not the one who... Was, is the genius. I'm not the one who spent days with Christ in the garret. Um, and so on. So I just want to make a caveat that uh, what I want us to know is that this, this uh, angel beast. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you see especially the, poten the potential for an a, a issue that we don't want to emulate in her resistance, or do we? So, for example, one of the ways that we need to learn to read lament in the Psalms, for example, is, is to not stumble on what the psalmist is saying, but to understand what the psalmist is doing. So, imprecatory psalms calling for vengeance against enemies can be offensive if you just take it as Oh, this is what he's saying. We should go dash babies' heads on the stones. But if you go, what is the psalm doing? The psalm is about crying out. The psalm is about processing anger. The psalm is about coming through to peace. And releasing our rage in the presence of God so that we don't hurt anybody. All right, now let's do this with Simone Bay using Love 3. Here's a woman who's resisting God to the bitter end. Resisting his love, resisting his grace, you don't do that. Well, then why is she praying love three every day? <laughs> and that's all she prays until she picks up on the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. She is bringing her resistance into the light, even her eating disorder, into the presence of God, and she's resisting her resistance. Every day she's experiencing this profound rejection of grace in her life, but she prays it and prays it and prays it, praying, so I did sit and eat. So I did sit and eat. So I did sit and eat until, until she's possessed by Jesus. And even that, he, he could not do that unless she surrendered and opened the door. So you see what she's doing by praying this. She knows there's an issue she brings her issue to Jesus, and then she receives him. Same with in Marseille. He can't love me. It's a mistake. His kindness is a mistake. He threw me out. I can't take his love. But maybe, maybe, maybe he loves me. So it's, it's her last word is this word of surrender. So what she's saying is atrocious in some ways. But what she's saying is, is in the presence of God. And I, I'm, I'm looking at the dialogue in Love 3. I'm like, this is a spiritual direction session. <laughs> I come to Steve and I say, I'm not worthy. And he says, well, have you thought of it this way? What about this? Um, I can't look on him. Well, what? and so I'm bringing all my resistance to the surface to, with my spiritual director, right? <laughs> And, and it's that process, that, Glenn, what you're saying is that we, can't, we mustn't bypass that, that kind of resistance. Think if you did, just read the poem in the opposite way, all right? I'm not a guest, I'm worthy to be here. <laughs> Who, me? Unkind, ungrateful? Absolutely not. I'm the kindest and most grateful person I've ever met. And I can look on you. And in fact, I have no shame to, that comes to mind. I'm shameless. And in fact, you should probably serve me now. You know, like, 
creepy. It's creepy. <laughs> it's worse, isn't it? And so she, in, on, on one level, she's resisting the old self that rejects grace, but on the other hand, how dare we do that without resisting the old self that presumes on grace? And so, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. It's a welcoming of mercy, but only by the person who is qualified by knowing their need of mercy. I'm reading in George Herbert here, somebody who saw his need of mercy and saw his resistance to mercy and works it through with Jesus Christ, his spiritual director. So, this is what Ve is up to. You've got to always ask with her, not just what she's saying, what is she up to? And there, you're like, oh my goodness, this is, I want to know you, you know. Well, what we're going to slip into until lunchtime, is a, it's a shorter session now. Her last words were written words in a journal from her bed. I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, her last words were something like this as she scrawls them, barely legible. The most important thing to teach is how we know. And then she writes, nurses, period. And then she dies. The most important thing to learn or to teach is how we know. And this, this is what we want to talk about in this session because, um, and I'll just give away the punchline, contemplative knowing is the highest way of knowing. And contemplative knowing is marked primarily by love. That's where we'll head. Um, so, let's start at the beginning. Before she ever knew Christ, and long after she knew Christ, she, she believed this, that if there, if there is a good with a capital G, that this did not show up lately on the scene as a Jewish god or... Greek God, or even as Jesus. If humankind goes back, let's make up a number, 60,000 years. Do we think God really only started reaching out to people 2,000 or 3,000 years ago? <laughs> Do we think that, that God only showed up in a little patch of Palestine a little while ago in human history, a sliver of human history? That's bonkers. And so she would say, well, clearly, if there's a good and if there's a God who actually created us in some way and loves us in every way, uh, that God would have, would have been approaching humankind in grace right across every people group and every tradition from as early as possible. And even though our human conceptions of God really limit what that can look like in our experience, God is not limited from, from revealing himself in grace. And so she would look for what she would call intimations of divine love in all these traditions. And she would see intimations of Christian love in all these traditions, uh, she, she would have in the end said, perhaps said, that Christianity, and by that I don't mean church, I mean that Jesus Christ was the perfection of, to which all the intimations were pointing. Just as the Old Testament pointing to Jesus, the Bhagavad Gita pointing to Jesus, the, in fact, she said, I, I, you know, if you go to India, you don't give them an Old Testament, require them to become a Jew, and then, and then give them Jesus. The Bhagavad Gita is their Old Testament pointing to Jesus. So probably if she made an Indian Bible, the Old Testament would be the Bhagavad Gita. And I don't know that I agree with that or should agree with that, but that's how she saw, certainly saw it. She would see um, revelations of this divine love pointing to Christ, especially in Greek mythology and in Greek philosophy, um, but she'd do this everywhere, Egypt, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and she'd look there, and she'd be like, wow, look at this. And, and so she saw, she saw divine love everywhere, and she saw it then perfected on the cross, because God, now God had actually entered human affliction fully. And he's not perfected until he does that in our hearts. So there's a Jesus thing that's really immense, but also that it's not going to be a narrow... Uh, possibility for experiencing God. Now, she would go looking for this and write a lot about it in her journals. Um, one example 
would, would uh, her favorite was Plato, and she's she calls Plato the father of Occidental. That means Western mysticism. People th- often think that f- Greek philosophers were these rationalists and so on. She goes, she says, oh no. He's the father of mysticism, and he was pointing to Jesus. Um, and when I say Plato, I mean Plato writing about Socrates. And so, for, for example, in Plato's Republic, which was one of her Bibles, this is the Old Testament for Greek philosophy. Um, um, in Book 2, Plato's having a discussion with, I think it's his, Socrates is discussing with, with his brother Glaucon. And Glaucon is talking about perfect justice, heavenly justice. And he says this, if perfect justice or heavenly justice would come into this world, it would come as the perfectly just man. And if the perfectly just man, slash righteous, same word in Greek, perfectly righteous, just man were to show up in the world, we would reject him, we would arrest him, we would beat him, and we would crucify him. And he uses the word crucify. 390 years before Christ. This is a prophet. And so that's how she saw him, right? There's intimations of, 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 of Christ in this. And that in a sense, you, you know, you're not going to hire Socrates as your youth pastor. <laughs> but <laughs> Christ is the fulfillment of things Socrates dreamed of and couldn't dream of. All right, now let's come back to knowing how we know. And, and um, so for her, a really big deal is the allegory of the cave. Some of you may know that and some may not. So I'm going to try to read it for you quickly. Because this is the foundation of her whole philosophy of knowing that will lead us to contemplative knowing. Um, here is a parable. So this is Socrates talking. Here is a parable to illustrate the degrees in which our nature may be enlightened or unenlightened. Imagine the condition of men living in a sort of cavernous chamber underground. With an entrance open to the light and a long passage all down the cave. Here they have been from childhood chained by the leg and also by the neck so that they cannot move and can only see what is in front of them because the chains will not let them even turn their heads. At some distance higher up is a light of a fire burning behind them. And between the prisoners and the fire is a track or a path, the parapet built along it, like the screen at a puppet show, which hides the performers while they show their puppets over the top. I see, said he. It's the guy he's having his conversation with. Now behind this parapet, imagine persons carrying along various artificial objects, including figures of men and animals in wood or stone or other materials, which project above the parapet. Naturally, some of these persons will be talking, others are silent. It's a strange picture, he said, and a, and a strange sort of prisoners, like ourselves, I replied. For in the first place, prisoners so confined would have seen nothing of themselves or of one another except the shadows thrown by the firelight on the wall of the cave, of the cave facing them. Now, um, and, 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 then, and they would have seen as little of the objects carried past and and so this friend says of course now if they could talk to one another would they not suppose that their words referred only to those passing shadows that they saw and suppose their prison had an echo from the wall facing them when one of the people crossing behind them spoke they could only suppose the sound came from the shadow in front of their eyes no doubt In every way, then, such prisoners would recognize as reality nothing but the shadows of those artificial objects. Now consider what would happen if their release from the chains and the healing of their unwisdom should come about in this way. Suppose one of them, set free and forced suddenly to stand up, turn his head and walk 
with eyes lifted to the light, to the campfire. All these movements would be painful and he'd be too dazzled to make out the objects whose shadows he had been used to, used to see. What do you think he would say? If someone told him that what he had formerly seen was meaningless illusion, but now being somewhat nearer to reality and turned towards a more real objects, he was getting a truer view. Suppose further that he were shown the ob uh, various objects being carried by and were made to say in reply to questions what each of them was. Would he not be perplexed and believe the objects now shown him to be not so real as what he formerly saw? And if he were forced to look at the firelight itself, would not his eyes ache so that he would try to escape and turn back to the things which he could see distinctly, convinced that they really were clearer than these other objects now being shown to him? And suppose someone were to drag him away forcibly up the steep and rugged ascent and not let him go until he had hauled him up out into the sunlight, would he not suffer pain and vexation at some treatment? And when he had come out into the light, find his eyes so full of its radiance that he could not see a single one of the things that he has now been told are real. Certainly he would not see them all at once. He would need then to grow accustomed before he made was made to see things in the upper world. At first it would be easiest to make out shadows and then the images of men and things reflected in water and later on things themselves and after that it would be easier to watch heavenly bodies and the sky itself by night looking up into the light of the moon and stars rather than the sun and the sun's light in the daytime. Last of all he would be able to look up at the sun and contemplate its nature not as it appears when reflected in water or any alien medium, but as it is in its own domain. And now he would begin to draw the conclusion that it is the sun that produces the seasons and the course of the year and controls everything in the visible world. Moreover, it is in a way the cause of all that he and his companions used to see. Clearly, he would come at last to that conclusion. Then if he called to mind his fellow prisoners and what passed for wisdom in his former dwelling place, he would surely think himself happy in the change and be sorry for them. They may have had a practice of honoring and commending one another with prizes for the man who had the keenest eye for the passing shadows and the best memory for the order in which they followed and accompanied one another so that he could make a good guess as to which was going to come next. Would our released prisoner be likely to covet those prizes or to envy the men exalted to honor and power in the cave? Would he not feel like Homer's Achilles that he would far sooner be on earth as a hired servant in the house of a landless man or endure, any, endure anything rather than go back to his old beliefs in the way in the old life? Now imagine what would happen if he went down again to take his former seat in the cave. Coming suddenly out of the sunlight, his eyes would be filled with darkness. He might be required once more to deliver his opinion on those shadows in com competition with prisoners who'd never been released while his eyesight was still dim and unsteady. And it might seem take some time to become used to the darkness. They would laugh at him and say that he had gone up only to come back with his sight ruined. It was worth no one's while even to attempt the ascent. If they could lay hands on the man who was trying to set them free and lead them up, they would kill him. Yes, they would. So, A crass way to read that would be that in the cave is this world and out of the cave is heaven or some other world. That's not it. That is crass. Um, what, in fact, they makes it clear that it's not, we're not just talking about this world and some supernatural world in exiting the cave. She says, the object of my search is not the supernatural, but this world. The supernatural is the light that illumines this world with truth. So rather than signifying the world as the created order, the cave depicts our attachments to it, to the world. Associated with established lies, toxic mindsets, and destructive practices that dominate our society, in fact, in a sense, the cave is society and, all, and, the, and our attachments to the things. We veritably breathe them 
What we see as shadows and hear as echoes are mistaken for reality. Collective, illusory ways of knowing and being to which we are chained by attachment in darkness. Thus, the bondage we hope to escape is not the temporal life. In, uh, it is about waking up from a dreamlike existence of fatal perspectives and allegiances or loves. All right, so let me... Uh, I'm going to try to be Simone Weil as I'm describing the cave in terms of the contemplative journey and our ways of knowing. What, what, what Plato is trying to say is that there are, there are different layers of knowing in the world. The very lowest way of knowing is an opinion based in an attachment. To, you know, that would be a very low way of knowing. And you can just see that low way of knowing totalizing Facebook. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you want to see the cave, go to Facebook. I'm there all the time. I have to be there for marketing purposes. But, <laughs> wow. People with deep attachments to whatever. Expressing their opinions. That's the lowest way of knowing. That is the chains and the, the way of seeing. The way of seeing there is like just shadows. Thinking that the shadows are, are reality, right? And then, uh, and then up from there, Plato would say, um, you can get some facts. Facts that are available to your senses. This is an iPhone. I know this is an iPhone because I'm experiencing it, I'm touching it. And so somehow, uh, you, that's a way of knowing. It's, slight, it's factual. It's not even invisible. I can set, see, touch it, you know, that's available. And, and so that's a higher way of knowing than opinion. And then up from there, there's a higher way of knowing, and that, that would be when you can begin to know facts that are like invisible. When you can imagine something invisible like 2 plus 2 is 4. I could de demonstrate that. I can also see it in my head, though. But, but, but a billion. I, I can't see a billion or experience a billion, but I can know it in my head. I can even know that a billion and a billion is two billion. And that's all now in my head, right? I can imagine a perfect sphere, though I've never seen one. I've seen something like it, you know, but so now I can know in my mind these invisible things and I can reason. So this is reason now. So opinion, experience, reason. And then you can take reason very, very far to the mouth of the cave. But there are things beyond reason that you can't know and you can't access any more than you can jump to the sun to get its light. The light of the sun has to come to you. And, and in a profound anticipation of evolutionary theory, Plato even says, not only uh, must the sun come to your eyes, the sun creates your eyes, which is actually true. Uh, in terms of evolution, how that worked. Uh, but we'll, that's for another day. So, so, um, so this idea that the highest way of knowing involves me waiting and watching and receiving the sunlight from seven light minutes away is a picture of grace. And this is, so now, she transposes that, and she, not just her, this is what Plato's up to, to the contemplative journey. In our spiritual lives, we have opinions, and we have experiences, and we have reasons, but the highest way of knowing is when we stop striving and we have to wait at the mouth of the cave for God the Son to send us the light and warmth of grace, and we can only receive that. You, you, and so, um, and that this doesn't happen with your physical eyes or anything like that. This happens with the eyes of your heart. Aha, so now, there's this thing called, you have an organ called the eyes of your heart that 
Only that organ can see the love of God, can experience the love of God, can receive grace. In Greece, in Greek, it's called the nous, N-O-U-S. In the New Testament, sometimes it's translated mind, sometimes it's translated heart. The reason why people didn't know Plato was a mystic for so long is that they were translating nous as intelligence mm-hmm. and reason. And he's, he's just told you what reason is with a different word. And he says, reason can't get there. You have to have noose. And so ra- good rationalist translators, would, intelligence will get you there. No! <laughs> to quote Ron Dart, the noose is the, is the spiritual organ of your soul that turns towards the... the, the uh, uh-oh. What's it when a lover, it, it's the reaching out of divine love. It's the, the, the approach of divine love. What is it that turns to, to, to see and to experience and to receive grace? It's your noose. Set your minds, your noose on things above. Um, pray that, the, you know, that God would open the eyes of your noose. That's not always what the word that Paul's using. But this is, so the best translation would be mind slash heart. Or in French, um, uh, they will say spirit. It's your spirit. That's your noose. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open. And this is an amazing thing then for her. She can just go, she can look in Augustine. She can look in the Buddha. She can look in... In, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, she can look in Greek philosophy, and the eyes of the heart are everywhere. Everyone's talking. They know that there's something you can't see without the eyes of the heart, and that your eyes of your heart can't imagine it. They can only receive it. So she says this, faith is the experience of the noose, and man, they translated it intelligence. Faith is the experience of the noose that is lighted up by love. Truth as the light coming from the good. Right? So think of from the sun. The good which lies above essences. You know, higher than you can jump. The organ in us through which we see truth is the intelligence. Uh, The noose. The organ in us through which we see God is love. Uh, And now she's just done something. The eye of the soul for the contemplation of the divine is love. What did she just made a leap there, didn't she? Mm -hmm. She's actually saying your noose is love. Mm -hmm. So it would be, oh, sorry, the word I was trying to capture earlier from Rondart, the overtures of divine love. Mm -hmm. The noose, the noose, the eye of the heart, the organ of the soul that turns towards the overtures of divine love is, is the noose. But then what Simone Weil and George Grant, it's a massive breakthrough in philosophy when, that Paul had already made, that, that the noose is love. You receive love with love. God is the noose with a capital N, and your heart... of. Your heart is the noose with a small end to receive that, like pe- a penetration. Think sex. And then, so, and, and so um, what, what they, I believe, rightly sees in this whole cave analogy is that there's grace all the way through. For example, who broke the chains in the first place that the prisoner could turn away? from looking at the wall. That's an act of grace. You can't break your own chains. Who drags the prisoner up to the mouth of the cave? It could be your spiritual director. <laughs> and it could be affliction. It's involuntary. There's a drag. And then you come to the mouth of the cave and you're blinded by this light and it takes time and you're looking. Now, so this is what, um, this is what like the great mystics all saw this journey, right? It's, what is it? The, the stages of the mystical negative, journey. Negativa, positiva. Negativa. So, and, and, and so it, there's a breaking of the chains. I want to, I'm going to find my notes and see the stages that these guys, she uses. Um, so, so many times there's, so there's an ascent 
And then you come to the mouth of the cave and you come to arrest because you can't jump to the sun and you can't make grace come to you. You have to wait. This is contemplation. There's attention, waiting for the light, waiting on the light. You you don't get to speed God up in his processes. And then there's awakening as you behold the sun. And then, um, and so... So this is, and, and she consciously talks about the parallels of Plato's cave to St. John of the Cross, Ladder of Ascent. It's, it's, it's we climb out of the cave, we, we're halted at the threshold, and then we behold the sun, and that's mystical union. Now here's, here's where some mystics make a mistake. They stop at union. That's, that's not the end of the story in the cave, is it? What's the end of the story in the cave? You go back into the cave to tell the prisoners. This is what John chapter 1 is engaging with Plato's cave at some level. The, the, he, the light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not receive it. And, and so the, incar- the whole incarnation thing is that the sun is actually manifest in a perfectly just man who has entered the cave and they mock him, and they beat him in the crucifix. And, and so for someone like a Simone Bay, it's like, you don't get to just go be a contemplative that doesn't now return to the world to do the work of justice. You, um, you, divine union isn't the final stop. It's now activation. So ascent leads to awakening, but then your, the awakening activates you by love to go live this, uh, take, take the light to others. And so uh, that's how, that's how uh, she sees that the, the end game of knowing is giving, giving your life in love. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she did that in, in ways that may not have been, I just don't know what else she could have done. But I'm not going to do what she did. <laughs> what I will do is try to know how she knew. So that's another thing. So the two things, maybe takeaways as we go to lunch. One is, maybe we, a takeaway from her is, like her, could we be as aggressive in resisting our resistance? Could we surface all of our resistances before God? And then before we come to surrender? Or will we keep some resistance hidden? <laughs> She sure didn't. And then the other is, could we learn that figuring out is not going to get us there? Well, that's why we're in Soul Stream, isn't it? I mean, this is this is Soul Stream, that 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 uh, we found out that figuring it out doesn't do it. Uh, but it's also why one of our values in in Soul Stream is is engagement, and it's people like Merton that actually influenced. Buddhism to become to have a stream called engaged Buddhism <laughs> where we re it's not about nirvana that's not the end no it's about life in this world living the love of uh, and, and living the light and so on well I'm I'm sure not there but it, it it is why justice issues matter at soul stream we're not just navel gazers here at least we try not to be Let's have lunch, and then we'll come back after and talk more about her cosmology of the cross. The whole, the whole universe revolves around this, and we'll get to that in a while.